Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you today. I have to tell you, all through the week, I've heard about people who are going to be traveling and all through the week. I know that people have been gotten sick. There's just a lot of stuff going on right now. But we're going to have a good day, regardless of what happens today, because God is a good God, and He is stronger than anyone or anything we ever face. And I say that knowing that the train's going to be going before too long, and maybe even we're making some noise today, but I'm not going to let that bother me either. Last week, when the earpiece kept on falling out of my ear, I just thought, the devil wants to snatch this day, and I'm not giving it to him. I'm not going to ever give the Lord's day over to the evil one. I want to make sure that when we gather together, we remember where we are, who we're with, and the price that he has given us. Yes, it's a crazy time, and every time we watch the news, we see something more than... We think, man, oh man, I thought that would never happen. I never thought that would take place. But you know what? We only complain, I think it's fair to say, because we used to have make good. Isn't that true? We used to be in blessed. And it's when things come our way that we don't expect, things come our way that we wouldn't necessarily ever invite, we can know that we have God with us. And that makes everything different. There's no doubt about that. And someday, know this. Someday, according to the scriptures, even the harshest things that have ever happened in our life will seem like nothing compared to the glory we're going to be for how long we're going to be there forever. And amen to that. But in this world, there are some mysteries. And if you looked at today's sermon title, you'll see that the sermon title is Responding to Life's Mysteries. And there are mysteries. And the mysteries are all around us. But we need to recognize not only the mysteries, there are answers. And there is one who is the answer. And he's got a word for us today. If you don't know where we are going to be today in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Mark, is Mark chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 31 through 37. And I have to tell you, this passage of Scripture, this event that we're talking about today, is only recorded in the book of Mark. None of the else with other gospel writers wrote about it. This gospel account we're reading today is different than any other thing we see Jesus do. We read this and we go like, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why he did that. Never saw him do that before. And we're reminded of a lot of different truths. And as I prayed and thought about it, just a lot of different things came to me in my spirit, I believe, from God to share with you. So I'm excited to be able to share it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dig in. Father, we know, Lord, that there are a lot of things going on in the world. We think sometimes just about the things that are going on in our little personal worlds, and we don't ever want to minimize those. But at the same time, there's things happening everywhere. And there's people that are going through all different kinds of things everywhere. And some of the people going through things are people who we know and are people who we love and people we just want to be able to be with them in every way we can. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are stronger and you are with them. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. Father, we pray today, Lord, that we would be able to be thankful. We talked about that last week. And having an attitude of gratitude changes the way we see the world and changes the way we respond to it. Father, may we remember that how we choose to see the world, the world sees us. And Father, we pray, Lord, that the world would see in us the fruit of your spirit and love and grace and peace and strength and gentleness and faithfulness and, and self-control. Father, we pray, Lord, that today, Lord, and all the different things that are passing through our mind and passing through our heart, that we would invite your word to just really read us as we read it. We would ask your spirit to reveal to us the things that you'd have us to know, have us to know, remember, and practice. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your entire word, for we know your word is true. Jesus himself said, not even one jot or tittle will pass away, Lord, before the things of God. And Father, we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that you're here, and we pray, Lord, that now we would just really be led by your Spirit. And we thank you for the gathering, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, it's great to be with you. I always look forward to Sunday. To me, Sunday is like Thanksgiving every single week, because I love when we assemble in the, in the name of the Lord. And as I've been praying about this particular passage of Scripture, time and again, I found myself thinking something. And the thing that I kept on thinking about was this. Life is filled with questions. Have you noticed that? That life is filled with questions. Now, some of the questions that life is filled with are very easy to answer, and there's no doubt about that. Let me give you a few examples of easy questions, things that are very easy to answer. What's the name of the NFL team that's playing in the city of Philadelphia and has been playing better lately? I bet most of you know the answer to that question. It's an easy one, the Eagles. Let me give you a couple other easy questions that are just real simple and easy to answer. 
to Mark Hoff and his daughter, Heather Peterson, have beautiful singing voices. I think we know the answer to that. It's a pretty simple one, isn't it? Is Mrs. Callahan a gifted baker? I know that we know the answer to that because we see people flood the back just as quickly as the service is over when she's brought the food. Can Joel Dugan and Al Garrett cook? Do Rob Yates and Jim Roby enjoy going fishing out in the middle of nowhere, being together and sharing that time? Yes, there are questions in the world and some of them are really easy to answer, but some of the questions that we see in the world are a little bit more complex. If you think about it a little bit, you find yourself thinking, hmm, some of the questions that I stumble upon, they make me pause just a little while, I pause momentarily and I say to myself, hmm, for example, why doesn't glue stick to the inside of the bottle? You ever thought about that? I saw glue the other day over a shop right up here in Upper Township, and I saw that they had a big old bottle of it, and yet none of it was sticking to the inside of the bottle, and I found myself going, hmm, that's interesting. What do you plan if you want to get seedless watermelons? I just don't understand that at all. If vegetarians love animals so much, how come they eat all the animals' food? That's an interesting question, isn't it? How do you know if invisible ink starts to run out? Why in the world is the word abbreviation such a long word? Seems interesting that that would be the case. If yesterday were today, then wouldn't today be yesterday? Hmm. If money doesn't grow on trees, then why do banks have branches? If babies wake up almost every two hours, how come everybody walks around talking about how much they want to sleep like a baby? Hmm. Some questions are easy to answer. Some questions are a little bit more complex. And then there are some things that are rather confusing. In fact, they're very confusing. For instance, maybe this isn't your experience, but this seems to happen in my house and it's been happening for years. Okay? Why is it if you put eight pairs of socks into the washing machine, you can only retrieve six, and every one of them is different in color and in texture? So why in the world is that? Does that happen in your house too? Why is it that when I'm driving up in Philadelphia, particularly if I'm driving on a school pool, which I've been aware of all of my life, I come into heavy traffic, every lane that I try to get into is slower than all the other lanes. Why is that? Why is it that doctors can run a heart catheter through a person's wrist? I've noticed that. And yet they still have not been able to find a cure for the common cold or even a headache. Interesting, isn't it? And then there are other questions, the mysteries, if you will. Such as, who can fully fathom the vastness and the power of the sea? Having lived in the desert for 30 years, just coming back and seeing the ocean every once in a while, well, is the water powerful? And there's no doubt about that. Having walked every day for the last few days and walking by the water, wow, is the, is the, is the ocean vast and is it powerful? Who can make the moon pull the tide to just the precisely right height causing oxidation to come into this world. If the moon weren't placed just where it was, the waves wouldn't be big enough to be able to create oxidation, and if the waves were any bigger than what they were because the moon was in a different position, what would happen in this planet, everything would flood. Why are the waves not too small? Or why are the waves not too large? And who positioned the moon? Who put the moon in exactly the right place? Well, I can answer that question. That's an easy one. And what about space with its synchronized planets and stars? How were they all set in place, and how were they all put in motion, and with just a, a modicum, let's put it this way, and with just a modicum of trepidation, why are some folks so astonished, if not completely offended, when Christians rejoiced after seeing a photograph that was taken by NASA's Hubble telescope that, that shows, that depicts an X-shaped structure that greatly resembles a crucifix? Have you seen that? Out as far as Hubble can go, Hubble is the strongest telescope that's ever been made on the face of the earth. And as far as it can go, if you take it to as far as it can go, what do you see in the middle of the space? You see a form. And the form is in a crucifix, and it has a figure that's on the form. Now, to me, it's amazing that the NASA telescope can travel at the speed and, and travel into something that's 1,100 light years from Earth. Why did that let you know how deep space is and how big space is? And when it discovered what's out there in the middle of nowhere, as far as we can go, what did they find? They found a form that resembles the crucifix. Hmm. Now think about that for a little while. And try to put it in some forms in your head and in your heart. What's the speed of light? Well, if you're a student of science, you know that the speed of light is 670 billion, 616 uh, million, 629 miles per hour. 
Now, how many hours are there in a year? 8,766. So if you want to find the speed of light, what do you have to do? You have to multiply those lights together. And when you want to multiply those numbers together, I'll tell you what you discovered. 5 trillion, 878 billion, 625 million, 370 thousand, or 6 trillion miles are traveled by the speed of light in a year. And the crucifix form is about 1,100 light years from Earth. I can't even begin to do that math. And even if I could do that math, I think the only person who would probably know what the answer would be as far as being able to name the number would be Michael Capito. I don't know anybody else is good. Wow. That's astonishing, isn't it? Now, no wonder some people have said that when they've looked at that particular figure, and if you haven't looked it up, look it up on the computer and you'll see for yourself what it looks like. Some people have named this the gateway to heaven because it's the center of the universe. Now, when Hubble started getting all these people calling in, when NASA started having all these phone calls saying, what is this thing that we've seen out in the middle of nowhere? There's been a lot of different people who have reacted in a lot of different ways. They put forward a response. Let me tell you what they said in that quarter. It says the cross appears in, elusive, in the elusive space picture and marks the exact position of a black hole. Okay, that's interesting. They go on to say the darkest bar may be an edge-on dust ring, which is 100 light years in diameter. Wow, that's a long way, isn't it? 100 light years in diameter. The second bar of the X would be a second disc seen on edge of possibly rotating gas and dust intersecting with jets and ionization cones. Hmm. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm sharing with you. I am not asserting that this form that resembles a cross out in the middle of space someplace is further proof of the existence of God. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the Bible says very clearly that creation shows the power of God. There's no doubt about that. And I'm astonished that some people are so offended when people remember that verse and think about that verse and cite that verse when they see this particular object that's up out in space. But other people, what do they do? They're offended by it. They're astonished that we're astonished. And it may very well be that this collection of dust that is up there is up there and has been collected in that form. But when I think to myself, wow, that's pretty amazing that it's been collected in that particular form. Wow. Now, before we move on from there, let me share with you another mystery. Not of things that are up in the sky, but let me share with you another mystery of things that take place under a microscope. Not long ago, I was reading a little bit about this. I found it very interesting. If an electron, if an electron were increased in the same size as an apple, and if a human being grew in the same proportion as what we just saw electrons being made into the same proportion of an apple, that person could hold the entire solar system in the palm of their hand and they would need a magnifying glass to be able to see it all. Wow, talk about powerful. On top of that, with a little bit of a little bit of trepidation, just a modicum of trepidation, let me show you something else I find very interesting. Have you ever heard of the protein in our bodies called lamellin? Interesting. Lamina. Look it up if you're not familiar with it. It's the extracellular matrix that provides support and the attachment for cells inside our organs along with other functions. Now some people in the medical community, when they started to study this stuff called lamina, call it this. They call it the glue to the connection tissue, keeping cells in place and allowing them to function properly. Now guess what? Guess what form it resembles? It too resembles a cross. Now, some people would say when they see that, wow, that's just pure proof that there's the existence of God. I'm not saying that when I'm up here, but I do know this much. The Bible speaks very, very clearly that not only when God made us, even our bodies, that he did something that's so powerful that not only our minds, but even our souls know it well, right? But the Bible also says that God holds all things together. What really astonishes me is that some people are so astonished and even offended when we say something like that after seeing something like that. Therefore, if you're with me today, and I pray that you are, some of our questions are easy to answer. Some of our complexions are a little, or some of our questions are a little bit more complex. Some of our questions are rather confusing, and nothing are some of them are nothing short of mysterious. And then there are the great mysteries. The ones that people have pondered and asked for thousands of years. And someday maybe we'll take some of those on too. Winston Churchill, smart man, the man who's considered to be the greatest man in the 20th century, described this kind of question. He said, it, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside of an enigma. Talk about a complicated thing. It doesn't get much more complicated than that. 
Truth be told, though, what do we know? We know that there are many riddles that remain wrapped in a mystery and shrouded, if you will, inside of an enigma. Now, Mark, chapter 7, verses 31 through 37, does not present to us that kind of a question. But it certainly, on the surface, when you just read it, seems rather peculiar. In fact, this particular passage is very unique. There's no other passage like this in the entire Bible. And there's no other writing about what we're going to be reading about in any other gospel other than Mark. Truth be told, when we read this, if we don't study this, it's, it's rather perplexing. In fact, it's very perplexing. It tells us about a miracle that Jesus performed on a needy man, but the way that the Lord decided to heal him was unlike any other account we see in the Bible. Well, we've been talking about it. Let's read it together and see what we can learn. Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. That's the Holy Spirit to reveal to us why this is in the Bible and what we can learn from it. Mark tells us, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him, Jesus, to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven when the deep sigh said to the man, Epatha, ep epatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them, all the people who were there and saw this, not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Wow. Have you ever read any other questions in the Bible that looks like that? Have you had any conversations with people saying, yeah, I read about this passage where Jesus is putting his hands in people's ears and he's putting spit on people's tongues and all that kind of stuff. What in the world is going on in this? Well, let's talk about what we just finished reading. Jesus is on the move and he's engaged in ministry and he's making his way up through the northeast region of Tyre and Sidon near modern day Lebanon. Let me tell you the reason I tell you that because this is a true story that took place in a real place and it's something we do need to be able to understand and remember. As Christ was traveling, what happens? A group of people come up to him. They bring a man to him who's deaf and he's unable to speak. And what do they do when they bring this man to him? They come up to Jesus and they start to plead with Jesus to do what they say. Heal him. Heal him. Well, how did Jesus respond? The Bible tells us that he took the man aside. He took the man away from the crowd. Christ healed the, the needing man. But again, the methods that he used in this account are so different from any other methods he used in any other place in the scripture. It touches our hearts to know that Christ saw the needy man. He cared about the needy man. And it touches our hearts to see that he not just saw him and he didn't just care about him. He took action. The Lord healed the man who was deaf and unable to speak. But to say the least, he certainly didn't do it in the way that we would expect. What did Christ do? We've talked about it a few times. Christ put his fingers in the man's ears. And after that, what did Christ do? He spat and he touched the man's tongue. And then, what did Jesus do after that? He looked up to heaven, and after looking up to heaven, what does he do? He sighs, and then he says a word in Aramaic. He says, Epha hepha, which means be open. And at that very moment, what took place? The man's ears were open, and he could plainly speak. After that, what did Christ do? He gave a commandment to every single person who was around him, saying, don't share about what you've seen done right before you. Yet how did they respond when they heard those words? They shared far and wide everything that had taken place. Now, why was it so difficult for them to be silent? Well, we see the answer to that in verse 37. It answers that question telling us the people were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Now again, it touches our hearts that Jesus healed the man, but why did he do that in such an unusual way? Why did Christ take his fingers and put them in the man's ears? Why did he spit and then touch the man's tongue? Talk about being surprised when you're reading the Bible. Talk about being caught off guard when you're going through God's word. Yet all these actions, like every action that Jesus took, were absolutely intentional. So what can we learn from what we've read? What do we do well to note? What do we do well to remember? What do we do well to practice? When you're reading the Bible, ask God to reveal to you what you are reading. Ask God to reveal to you what he wants you to learn, what he wants you to know, what he wants you to remember, what he wants you to put into practice. And as I prayed over and pondered this particular passage, the Lord gave me a number of different observations. And then after giving me a lot of observations, 
he pressed into me very, very deeply a deeper spiritual truth. So let me share with you first some of the observations that God put in my heart. First is this, as the Lord traveled, he heard the cries of those who brought a needy man before him. Amen to that. I think about that and I think it's so good to know that when Jesus was here, what did he do? He heard the heart cries. He heard the heart cries. And he didn't just hear the heart cries, he saw the needy man. In fact, Jesus, when he looked at the man, didn't just see his physical needs, but he also noticed his emotional and his spiritual needs. What can we learn from that? What can we know? What can we remember? What can we put into practice? Let me share with you what the Lord told me to share with you. We do well to follow the example of Jesus and slow down just a little bit on life's journey. That's hard, isn't it? I've been ADD all my life. I think I'll go to heaven in ADD. Or maybe that's the only time I won't go ADD. But it's important at times just to slow down. Just to slow down on life's journey and to see what? And to see the person in the people. Have you noticed there's not a lot of people looking around and seeing the person in the people? When I think about seeing the person and the people, I'm reminded of the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 13, verse 6, where Jesus said, blessed are your eyes. And then he says, why your eyes are blessed? He said, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. In this inside out, upside down world, it's so easy to see right through people. Have you noticed that? It's so easy to see right through people. When I was a young pastor and I'd be going to the hospital and I'd be with people who were old enough to be my grandparent, when the doctors and nurses sometimes talked about their particular condition instead of speaking to them, and it was their body and what they were going through, they spoke to me. Why? Because they were just absolutely seeing through people rather than seeing the person within the person and they could hear everything that they said but they never really heard the words behind their heart. What did Jesus told me to share with you? He said to me, slow down. Slow down. See with his eyes. See with his ears. But that's not the only thing that the Lord told me to write this particular account. Notice how Jesus responded. What did he do when he came upon this new man? Well, the first thing he did was he took the man aside. I think that's significant. In other words, he took him away from the crowd. He didn't want to embarrass the man, much less make a spectacle of himself or make a spectacle of the man. Taking the man aside from the crowd was a sign of what? It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of value. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus said these words. He said, blessed are the merciful. What does mercy require? Mercy requires more than simply hearing and seeing. Mercy requires a response. Why is that so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. It's so easy and so tempting to let our hearts harden. Isn't that true? In this particular world, it's so easy to let our hearts harden and completely forget something that's so important for us to remember. And let me tell you what it is. Everyone, yes, everyone, we lock eyes on have been created in the image of God. Lest we ever forget that, everyone, everyone we lock eyes on has been created in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says it very clearly. It says, so God created man in his image, and in the image of God, he created him. Therefore, yes, every person, every person has in, is inherent value because they have all been made in the image of God. Talk about being transformation when we look at people and we see them and we see what's going on. May we always remember that every moment like God's on has been made in the image of God. There's a third thing that I see as I read this particular passage. Not only did Jesus notice the man, what else did he do? He touched the man. Touching people is important. I remember in, in New Mexico in my last church, there, was a, there were a couple of widows that were filled with people who were widows. They were all widows. They all sat together. And we did what we have done at Heavenward before this pandemic came. During our time of welcome, people would get up and they'd walk all around the whole church. It took as long as the sermon on us sometimes to get there. Well, that's a long time, isn't it? And then um, to, to make the circulation of just being able to hug everybody. And I'd get up to the aisles where these ladies would be sitting in their chair. And I'd hug all of them. And then a lot of times on the way out the door, they'd say to me, You know what, Pastor? My family doesn't live here. You're the first person who's touched me all week long. And I thought to myself, wow, Jesus often touched people and amen to that. But what did Jesus do in this particular passage of scripture? He put his fingers in the man's ears. Then what else did he do after that? He spit and touched the man's tongue. What was he doing? He was touching his ears and his tongue because those are the very places that the man struggled. 
And interestingly, if you look it up in a biblical dictionary, you'll see that the word touch that's translated in NIV literally means to take a hold of. That's significant, and I'll tell you why. Because Christ could have done this. He could have just put up his hand, or he didn't even put up his hand, and he could have just spoken a word, and healing would have taken place because he did that at other times, so and there's no doubt about that. So what's he doing when he's touching the man? He's communicating to him very clearly, I'm with you. Same things you're doing when you pat somebody on the back. Same thing you're doing when you're standing beside somebody. I'm with you, I'm here, I get it. What a powerful reminder that true compassion doesn't just feel what this true compassion do. It reaches out. Fourth, what did Jesus do next? He looked up to heaven. What a powerful reminder that his divine power was not from below, but from above. And may we always recognize that. And let me tell you something else. When we look to heaven in prayer, we get a very special blessing. And I'll tell you what it is. We begin to see the world through the Father's eyes. Why is it so important to be in the Word so that the Word can be in you? Why is it so important to pray? Why is it so important to pray up to heaven so that you can see the world through God's eyes? How much different would we respond if we saw the world through God's eyes? And what did Jesus do after that? He looked up to heaven and looked up to heaven. What was his next move? He sighed. And if you look it up in the original language, you'll see that Jesus didn't just sigh, he deeply sighed. It was a sign to let the man know that he was deeply moved by his condition, and it was a sign to let the man know that he really did care. A wise person once said these words, and you have to ruminate on it for a little while for them to really sink in the way that I believe that they need to. He said, there is no place where earth sorrows are more felt than in heaven. Sometimes we think we care about people more than Christ. That is just so wrong. There is no sorrow, no place on earth where your sorrows are more felt than in heaven. Amen to that. But what about you and what about me? Are we deeply moved by the condition of those around us? Do we really care? And are we really praying? Fifth, what do they do? Christ said to the man, Epaatha. This is an Aramaic term which means not only to be open, but to be completely open. And what happened when he said those words? The man's ears were open and he could hear and speak very plainly. So what have we seen? We've seen that Jesus heard, he saw, he touched, he prayed, he sighed, and he healed the man. Now I want you to think about what we just finished reading. How much would the world be better, and how much would our personal worlds be better, if we made the decision, and it's a decision we have to make for ourselves that no one can make for us, if we truly heard not just the words that people say, but we heard the words behind their heart. It would make a difference, wouldn't it? Think about how much better the world would be and how much better our personal worlds would be if when we saw people, wherever we were and whatever was happening, we remembered that they were created in the image of God. Think about how much better the world would be and our personal worlds would be if we reached out in compassion and let people know we are with them, we are here, we get it, and we want to respond in the love of Christ. Think with me about how much better the world would be and our personal worlds would be if we prayed more often and we prayed more fervently, recognizing that, that transformational power comes from above. It does not come from below. Think with me about how much better the world would be in the, and our personal worlds would be if our hearts were broken by the things that break the heart of God. Think with me about how much better the world would be and our personal worlds would be if we really start to bring healing and restoration in the name of Jesus. Those are just some of the observations that the Lord revealed to me as time and again I prayed over this particular passage. Yet, yet, and it's a potent yet, there's also a deeper lesson that I believe we need to know, we need to remember, and we need to put into practice. What is it? Well, Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 7 reminds us that the Lord's ways aren't always what we would expect. I'm going to slow down just a second. And I want you to read it again. As I read over this passage and I prayed about it time and again, it reminded me that the Lord's ways are not always what we would expect. Now, what do we know? We all know this in our heads, right? Because we've been lived for a while, you know that's true. But making the decision to say amen to it in our hearts is a whole other thing. I want to go a little deeper. I want to be a little bit more personal. Let's try to do that. Okay, let's go deeper and let's be more personal. Have you ever prayed and confidently asked for a need to be met or a problem to be solved and you really believed when you prayed that particular prayer that the Lord heard you and that he would help you? 
In fact, truth be told, you believed us so greatly that you started to do what? You started to daydream about how it would take place. You started telling yourself, he's going to do it this way. He's going to do it this way. I know exactly what he's going to do. Because I trust him. He loves me. He cares for me. I know what he's going to do. You heard my prayer. He's going to do it just exactly the way that I think. You know what I'm talking about. You expect things to go a certain way. And you anticipate that they should go that way. You tell yourself, he's going to answer my request. He's going to do it just the way that I thought. But then something happens. It doesn't go that way. In fact, it doesn't go at all the way you thought it would. And in those times, what starts to happen becomes more than a little bit tempting to wonder if the Lord even heard our prayer, much less was responding to it. You know what I mean? You have a task that you want to perform, and you ask the Lord to bless your effort and make things go well. Yet the task doesn't get easier, it becomes harder. New challenges are encountered that you never dreamed would come your way, and the immediate results are certainly not things that you ever expected would come your way. And in the middle of it, what did you start to do? It's so easy to pull back and wonder, if not despair, asking, Lord, did you really hear me? Why didn't you help? In time, you did recognize that he did. But it certainly didn't come the way that you expected that it would. He answered your prayer. You recognize this at some point. Well, you will when you get to heaven. He did answer your prayer. And he answered your prayer better than you knew how to even ask. But at the time, it certainly didn't seem that way. And I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It's a familiar passage of scripture. Jesus says these words. He says, ask and to be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. But I want you to look at that verse more closely because this verse does not say you will get exactly what you asked for. It does not say you will find exactly what you sought. It does not say that the door will be open to exactly what you expected. Sometimes his answers are much different than our asking, our seeking, and our knocking. What do we know in our hearts? We know that his answers are better, so much better in the long run but they don't always show themselves in the way that we expect. There's a lesson in that. There's a lesson that I think we do well to know and remember, and it's this. Jesus doesn't always do the things we expect. Read the New Testament. Speak to other Christians. Think about your own life. Jesus doesn't always do things the way we expect. He doesn't always follow the particular lines we choose to set for him. And he often works in one situation in a very different way than he does in another. Now, yes, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the, always the same. And let me tell you something else. He is always good. But if we tell ourselves he's always going to respond in the way that we expect, guess what will happen? We'll be more than surprised. We'll be disappointed. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let that... That truth depress you, let it impress you. Don't let that truth knock you down, let it lift you up. Let me tell you this, the Lord is greater than our limited view. The Lord is greater than our limited view. Listen to his words in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. God is speaking to himself and he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Well, how much different are they? Well, look how the verses continue. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. What do we see in this particular passage? We see that the Lord hears us. Just because things don't go the way we expect doesn't mean he wasn't listening. Doesn't mean he wasn't working. Certainly doesn't mean he doesn't care. At times God says yes, and at times God says no, and at times God says slow, but he is always working in our lives greater than what we can see at the time. And let me share with you, and he does all things well. He is always working, and he does all things well. That's a deeper lesson in this account. At times, the way that he works seems strange to us. And they certainly must have seemed very strange to the apostles, and they must have even seemed even more strange to the needy man. But may we never forget there's always going more, more going on than what we know, and when we can't see God's hand, we need to trust his heart. So this morning, as I prayed over and pondered this particular passage, the more clear it came to me that these unusual methods were intentional. And I'll tell you why. Because they remind us we need to live by faith and not by sight. He wants us to look through an eternal lens rather than a temporal lens. And he wants us to trust him completely. Hear this. He wants us to trust him completely. 
come love me. And when you think about it, really think about it, that is the best response to the great mysteries and the wise of life. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, guess what? We'll know even as we're known. The scripture says that. We won't know in part and we'll know the whole. And in that moment, I'll tell you what will happen. It may not happen now, but it will happen in that particular moment. We will be like the people of the Decapolis who said, He does all things well. And as we await that time, let's respond by responding to life's mysteries by trusting Him. Come what may. <coughs> what can we learn from this passage? There's a lot of things that would absolutely revolutionize our life if we put them into practice. But the biggest thing that I see in this, the greater truth, the one that impressed on my heart to show with you is this. Don't just say you've got to do exactly what I say. Don't just look, expect him to do everything you think he should do at just this time, just that time. Trust him, come what may. And if you do that, someday, some glad and glorious day, you will say, like the people of God was, he has done all things well. Amen? Amen. Let's go learn with that. Father, we live in a world that's blinded. And Father, sometimes we're blinded ourselves. Father, you tell us, Lord, that some things are like looking through darkened glass. You tell us that there are secret things that belong to God and God alone. And Father, it's easy for us to make judgments, and it's easy for us to have anticipation that's sometimes not born of your spirit, but just born of our own desire. Father, help us to know that you know everything and help us to trust that. Father, help us to know that you love and you reach out and you are always working our life for you to be who began a good work and will be faithful to complete it until the day of salvation. Father, there are a lot of questions we have and some of them will be answered and many of them may not be. But Father, choosing how we respond to that truth sets the pace for our life. Father, may we remember that the way we choose to see the world is the way that the world sees us. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would be people of prayer, we'd be people who care, we'd be people of faith, and we would trust you, come what may. For we pray in Jesus' name.